Hello everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint a zebra in acrylics. Now for this I started off with an airbrush background but if you don't have an airbrush you can create something similar. The airbrush does give you a much softer appearance but you will be able to create something which is close. Now if I wasn't having, you know, using my airbrush I'd be using a fine mist sprayer bottle to keep my paint layers wet and that will enable me to blend out each layer with a paintbrush. You'd want a large soft black brush to blend out these layers, a large makeup brush would give you something very similar, but you will not be able to get as much softness as what I am here with this airbrush. Now for this I did want my bokeh effect, even though it is really subtle. It is more obvious in person than what you can see on this video, but I did want to try and get that if I could. So what I've done here is I've cut out a rough stencil, the shape of the zebra, because I wanted these circles to be more towards the subject. I wanted some of these circles to overlap parts of the, the actual ear itself and part of the muzzle, because I wanted the attention to be kept within the middle of this canvas. If I'm creating more of a general bokeh effect, I don't worry about this. I just put the circles randomly. I make sure that I use different size circles. You'll see here that I've got some that are brighter than others and that will help to create depth within that bokeh. But here, because I did want them in specific places around the edge of the zebra, I did use a stencil. Now for that, all I did is I traced my outline of my zebra, just that initial outline. I cut that out with just a bit of, you know, I used plain printer paper put that over the top of my canvas as you saw and that allowed me to have a rough idea of where that zebra was going to be so that I could position these circles where I needed them. I don't do this very often because these circles as I say I do more often do them more random but for this was slightly different. I pushed the first layer of the circles back with a light layer of the blue and a black and then I've gone over the top added more of my brighter circles. I've tinted that with that really nice blue turquoise colour added now a layer of the black to push those back even more and you can see there that background it is subtle but I really did want to create that really nice soft circle bokeh glow and depending on the subject and what it is that I am painting it might be that I have more of these circles and I make them more obvious like a recent dragonfly painting that I've just done but for something like this, I was going for subtle. I wanted all of that contrast, all of that attention to be on this zebra and creating that really striking effect between the black and white stripes. And if you'd like to see the full length tutorial of this, it is available over on Patreon. It's four hours long, so it's really in depth. It covers all of this in you know a thorough voiceover throughout. So if you would like to see that, I'll link my Patreon in the description below. So what I've done, I work in small areas. I find that I'm far more motivated and I achieve a lot more effectively, but also quicker. Now I like to work in this way because I like to be able to look at my reference photo and my painting and already tell that it looks like that photo. It does help me to work a lot more effectively as I've said. I like to make sure that I've got the eye finished before I move on to other areas. But unlike when I work with pastels or graphite, where I, you need to wait for a certain layer to dry, for instance, while I waited for parts of the eye to dry, I've now started refining my layer on the white stripes around the eye itself. So I'm using a various mixture of my titanium white, my Mars black, but I've always made sure that I've also mixed some of that teal blue colour in with my grey mixture. The reason being is whatever your background colour is, you should really try and incorporate that in your subject. So I wanted to make sure that there were glazes of this nice blue, the teal, the turquoise colour throughout this. And as this painting progresses, you'll see I really did use quite a lot of glazes here to achieve that. Maintaining with my small area there, while my first layer was drying on the bottom of my eye, I then started working on more of those whiter details that overlap the black stripes just indicating at that fur direction and while that's drying I then decided to map in the bridge of the nose as you can see here. This is certainly my preference when working with acrylics. I like to do this because I can now see more of the pieces of the puzzle sort of coming together. The painting becomes more realistic a lot quicker I find. Every painting, every portrait goes through an ugly stage and I don't like working in whole set layers because I do find that I'm stuck in that ugly stage for far too long. So this is certainly my preference. Now this section here of this video, you can see that my hands are moving here. This is a real time clip that's available on my Patreon channel. So I'm explaining as I'm painting what I'm doing. 
And for this, I'm very much working from dark to light. So I start off with my darker greys, more with that bluer colour mixed in with it. And each additional layer, once it's dried, I've added more titanium white to my mixture and building up my layers gradually. This zebra doesn't really have fur, so it's taken a slightly different technique to a pet portrait, maybe a Labrador or a German Shepherd, for instance. But the process is the same. I'd like to work from dark to light and build up my layers gradually. I'm not focusing on any kind of detail, I'm just wanting to get my lights and my darks in at this point. Now when you start working on the areas of the face here, you'll see that I've got more shadows in more of a defined area. Now the reason being is because they don't have long fur, the structure underneath the skin is going to be a lot more visible, just like with horses. Obviously these are very similar. So we want to make sure that we've got these differences in lights and darks in place to indicate at that face structure of the muscle and the bones underneath the skin. Now if we don't get these elements in the right place, we will then change the structure of that animal's face. And what will happen is the painting at the end when it's finished won't resemble as much of that reference photo as it should do. And while those areas below the eye there were drying, I just decided to work on the ears. Now, ears of any kind require quite a lot of attention to detail. You've got a lot of the fur direction that can change in different ways. So we really want to zoom in in that photo if you are using your tablet and really make sure that you're focusing on that. You want to lengthen your brush strokes and shorten them in other places where needed. As you can see what I'm doing here, I've swapped over to a liner brush to make sure that I've got these nice long details on my right hand side that are swooping over to the left. I need to make sure that they are curving in the right way to indicate at that fur, that inner ear detail. And I needed to get this left ear in place before I worked on the middle portion of the mane because as you can see, some of these details overlapped the left ear. So rather than do the mane first and then have to work around these details when I was painting the left ear, it's far easier to paint what's behind a subject first and work from there. So because I looked at that reference photo and saw that this mane did overlap this left ear, I therefore knew that I needed to paint the left ear first. And the process for the right ear is very similar, but because this ear is turned more towards the camera, we're able to see more of that fur direction on the left and the right side. Now regardless of any ear that you are painting, the subject, the, it's, the process is going to be the, the same. So you want to make sure that the middle portion of the ear is usually darker because the light is not able to get down to that ear, especially for an animal where you've got the ear shape like this. So the biggest tip for ears is make sure that if you do have something where you've got that dark centre, is get that as dark as needed to start with, wait for that to dry and then overlap your details on both sides. Getting the shape of the ears is crucial, so really study that photo. So here for the muzzle, this is one of the areas where I knew that I wanted to reflect a lot of this background colour in here. Because the light was just catching on the edge of that nose, I wanted to make sure that I could get that reflective light within that reference photo. Now obviously I have changed my reference photo quite a lot. So this reference photo was from Pixabay and it was in a natural setting. So it's surrounded by a lot of greenery. So this didn't have any of this strong blue light. So although I'm using my reference photo to get my stripes, to get the fur direction or the detail in the nose here, I always wanted to make sure that I adjusted my color palette accordingly to make sure that the background and the subject were one. And as like with the stripes, I'm working from dark to light. It's really important to make sure that you are adding these highlights in the right place. So for instance, here on the edge of the nostril, I've made sure that I've kept more of those highlights on the right hand side to really follow that light source. If you've got a reference photo and it does have a strong light source from one side, it's going to be really important to capture that. Just like fur direction, the light source, the highlights and the shadows, they're not random. They will follow that structure on the skin. There's going to be bounced reflective light. So really make sure that you study that photo. At this stage, I'm actually looking at my reference photo far more than I am my artwork. I want to make sure that I've got it as close as I can. It's only for the last couple of layers where I sort of stand back from my reference photo and I look at my artwork and I see what changes do I think I could make to this painting, this zebra here, to make it better than that photo. But if you're going for photo realistic or hyper realism, make sure that you've got a really good quality photo to work from. So if there's anyone that's new to acrylics and you're wondering how to get your outline on your canvas, your canvas board or your panel, whatever surface it might be, 
my preference is certainly to use transfer paper and that's what I've done here you can see that my lines are really clear they are very bright that was obviously more so because I've gone with a very dark background but you can get transfer paper in various colors now canvas I don't find it erases well so you want to try and make sure that you've got your sketch as accurate as you can on your first attempt because if you do use a, a pencil and I would recommend using a water soluble graphite pencil if that is your preference a white charcoal pencil is my go-to but if you're working on a light background obviously the white is not going to show up a normal graphite pencil is not my preference because it can show through when you put your painting layers on top whereas the water soluble will obviously help to dissolve that pigment when you come to put your layers on top but what my preference is is I like to get my sketch on a separate bit of paper so you can freehand that you don't have to trace it you can freehand that put that tape it to the corners of your canvas and put the transfer paper between that line art and your canvas and then use an embossing tool to transfer that line onto your canvas that will mean that your edges are nice and, and accurate they are you know you don't have to erase anything and it does help to keep everything nice clean and tidy that is really beneficial when you've put your background in first we work hard on these backgrounds so we don't want to then have any lines that we realize shouldn't be there and we have to then try and hide them so the preference of the transfer paper is my way that i like to put my outline on my canvas when working with acrylics so now that we're this far along you can see that i really have just been building up with my light layers gradually i'm now with each additional layer adding a small amount of titanium white as i go but i'm really focusing on the structures underneath the skin so here on the side of the face where the tongue would be within that mouth you can see that there's more of that bulge effect on the right hand side. I really wanted to make sure that I captured that and that was all in the lighting where my highlights are and where my shadows are. I've made sure that I've curved my brush strokes accordingly to make sure that I've also followed that structure over the skin. Now obviously the four hour version on Patreon you're able to see how I'm moving my brush and I explain this as I'm doing it so that's going to be a lot easier. But the main thing that we want to focus on here when we're working on an animal like this that doesn't have long fur is that we do make sure that we get these structures under the skin in place. This is what's going to make this zebra look three dimensional. And in the corner is a photo of my finished painting and you can see all of those differences in lights and the shadows. It's really, really important. So when we're working on the neck here, this is where we really start to indicate at that light source. The lower part of the neck is really nice and bright. That's going to really help to bounce up some of that light onto the face. So I'm starting in to map my white stripes in here. My preference is to do it this way when I'm working on a darker background so that I don't lose where these white stripes are. I can then go in and add my black stripes after. Exactly what I'm doing here. And for my thinner stripes, I like to use a smaller round brush. And as I get to more of those larger, wider stripes, you can then go up a couple of brush sizes if you need to. And you'll see that throughout this painting, I've never rested my hand on the canvas. I've either, like what I'm doing here, resting on my easel itself, or I've got that semi-translucent sheet of paper under my hand, which is glassine. That does two things. One, it will help to stop you smudging your transfer lines. It will also more importantly stop the oils of your skin coming into contact with the canvas obviously that will cause archival problems later on down the line so we want to try and avoid that now when you're doing this blocking in process here it's quite important to make sure that you've got the layer underneath completely dry so you can either fast that you know speed that up by using a hairdryer or just wait a few minutes and that will dry on its own so that's the benefit of using acrylics and that they do dry very fast on the other hand, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this tutorial, if you want to slow down that drying process because you want to do maybe some wet on wet blending, get a fine mist sprayer bottle, apply a very light layer over the top and that will help to keep that layer underneath wet for longer. If you do apply a layer of the, the mist the, with the water and you've got droplets running down your surface, that's a really good indication that you put far too much water on that layer. So you either need to wait for that to dry or if you can, which you only do this if the, the layer underneath doesn't have too much paint, you can lightly dab that water off. But my preference would be just to wait for that to completely dry on its own so that you don't smudge any part of your painting. I've mapped in where some of these darker creases are. I haven't gone as dark though as the black stripes, which is really important. These creases are still within those white stripes. So I just wanted to go with more of that teal dark grey colour. And then I can start mapping in the lighter creases around it. 
This is going to help to indicate that this zebra does have its head slightly turned towards the camera which is going to create those creases in the side of the neck there. Now when you are painting a zebra we want to make sure that we get these stripes in the right place and in the right direction. The reason being just like with the shadows and the highlights these will follow that structure of the skin to a degree. So that's more evident there on the side of the face below the eye you can see that it looks like it's got it droops in the middle and then curves up towards the left and the right that is indicating that the cheekbone is underneath so try and study that photo as closely as you can get an accurate line drawing to start with and if you need to trace that image then that is fine sometimes depending on what you read or what you see in tutorials it will say that che tracing is cheating you don't want to be tracing all the time, but tracing can certainly improve your freehanding skills. If you carry on freehanding something over and over, your brain may not then, you know, it might not realise the mistakes that you're making. If you trace that image five times and then try and freehand it the sixth time, because you've already forced your brain to draw it accurately those times before, the, the second attempt at freehanding will be far more accurate and improved compared to the first attempt. So tracing really does have its place. And I talk about it a lot in all of my tutorials about how important the contrast is. And here is really evident of that. I don't have any real fur direction detail as such, but what I do have is a strong difference between my highlights and my shadows. That's making this look realistic and three dimensional. I don't have to add individual detail here. So the finished painting in the corner, you can see that my nose looks quite a bit darker and my shadows look more soft. They've got a nice a bit more of that blurred effect. What I did, and you'll see this in a minute, is once the painting was almost finished, I then added some of my black mixture in my airbrush and went over some of my areas that I wanted even darker. And you'll see that I really do then hype up that shadow under the eye, around the ears, especially on the nose to really help to push those back. I wanted those highlights of the nose to be obvious, of course I did, I wanted that nose to be visible, but what I wanted is to push that back ever so slightly. I wanted to really hype up that contrast. I wanted the main focus to be on obviously the zebra, the contrast, the stripes, and at the moment here I felt that the highlight on the nose and that bluer tone was drawing my eye away to the muzzle area rather than initially the middle part of the painting. So I used that airbrush to push those areas back. Again, if you didn't have an airbrush, a glaze would do the same thing. So all I would be doing there is having my mixture of my Mars Black, watering that down ever so slightly for more of the consistency of milk, and then putting that over where I needed my shadows to be a bit darker. The airbrush does just create that really nice soft effect that I wanted for this. But as I say, a glaze would give you something very, very similar. I work a lot with glazes, which is why Liquitex Basics is my preference. They have a lot of really nice transparent colours that work really well for that. So when I come to the main area here, exactly the same process, I've mapped it in, but this is in quite a bit more shadow, so I've got more of my turquoise mixture added with more of my black. I'm really focusing on the brush direction here and it's random as you can see. Because the mane of the zebra is quite short compared to horses, it's not going to have as much of that flow in motion as what the mane of a horse or the forelock area would have. So we wanted to make sure that we really do get that randomness within this mane and the brush strokes here. So here is where I go back with my airbrush and you can see just how much it pushes back those shadows. And here is a finished photo of the painting itself. So I really enjoyed working on this painting, not focusing on colour as such, but more on my values. It can really help to just work more with your blacks and your whites. Sometimes adding colour can make the process a little bit more complicated. So if you're new to acrylics, something like this would be a good place to start. So I really hope this tutorial was of use. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, if you hit the bell and the subscribe button, you'll get notified of future videos. And if my slower tutorials on Patreon are of interest, I'll pop that link below. And also I'll put my Patreon library from my website in the description as well. That's got all of the list of all the tutorials available over there for anybody who does sign up to Patreon. If you've got any questions, then pop them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to answer them. Feel free to contact me on social media as well. And I'll be uploading another video here to YouTube at the weekend.